Uh, good evening, uh, friends uh, online. We we'll welcome you again to another evening of a fellowship and Bible study. Uh, if you're in Grand Cash and you can't make it down for our supper before the Bible study, you're really missing. Uh, <laughs> And so we thank God for his faithfulness. So tonight we're just going to continue with our Bible study. And uh, Sister Alicia will be reading from Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 12, right? All right. All right. Acts 13, 1 through 12, the English Standard Version. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Barnabas and Saul on Cyprus. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bargesus. He was with proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Eliamaeus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. May the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, that is the reading of the word, and may the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. The intelligent Holy Spirit, we just thank you for another evening. We thank you for your grace that is available to heal, to deliver. We thank you, Lord, that the entrance of your word tonight will bring understanding to us and lead us into all truth that will bring freedom and draw us closer to you. Lord, let the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the blood of Christ speak to us. Soften our heart to God to receive your word tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we continue with our uh, little uh, series on um, Dare to be Different, uh, Separation from the World. And as we look at the scriptures tonight, uh, Last Wednesday, we looked at in relation to the physical, our relationship, uh, because based on some of the questions that was asked. But tonight, we're going to be looking at uh, basically the spiritual aspect moving forward of what it means to be separated from the world, what it means to be separated unto the Lord. Amen. And so without uh, too much, uh, we're just going to go straight to our introduction and uh, notes. And for I realized something, too, that for the sake of clarity and followership, I decided to start numbering every line. That way we can be on the same page because I may be saying something and you'll be wondering, okay, where are we? <laughs> All right. And so number one. What, are we separate, what we are separating from is important, but what we are separating into is more important. And separation without transformation is incomplete separation. Now, what I, I, I will explain this first, number one, because every time we talk about, especially let's start with the word being saved, we are saved from, right? We are saved from sin. We are delivered from darkness. But the Bible says we are delivered from darkness into what? His marvelous light. Uh, a lot of people stop at that first instance. Oh, I've been saved. 
uh, God has set me free from. But th there is more to being saved if you were just saved and without any transformation and there's no continuity. Because Jesus don't, didn't just save us. He saved us from the world into his kingdom. He saved us from darkness into light. And so when we are talking about being separated from the world, we, don't, we are not just separated to become a vacuum. We are separated from into something else. God said, live here, you know, in the, the scripture say, come out from among them and be yet separate. And I'll be a God unto you and you'll be my own people. And so every time we talk about separation, we have to look at what, God, what is God calling us from and what is God calling us into. Amen. And so without knowing that, then the, the, the whole journey of separation becomes incomplete. And like I said tonight, we are looking at separation in relation to our spiritual work with the Lord. Walk again is talking about W-A-L-K, our character, our nature, in relation to what we profess to be as Christians. Amen. And so, uh, Acts chapter 13, they're still under number one there. As they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereto I have called them. You see, the, the scripture said, God says, separate them. But there was a purpose for that separation. And for you as a child of God, we, we, you are not just saved to come to go to church and look pretty every Sunday, which is good, it's part of it, but that's not a whole work. You are not just saved to have the title of, hey, I'm a Christian. You are not just, oh, I'm born again. There is more to just professing to be a born-again child of God. When God saved you, he saved you for himself and for a purpose. And the work of salvation continue into the sense of sanctification, which is separation. But God is just not separating us from the world so that we can create a vacuum. We just can sit back and just begin to look good like a, a decorated grandma china in the cardboard. Amen. You know how you have those uh, china plate that nobody ever uses in the house and it's there for years and it's so special and it's that, in that glass? You just keep looking at it. You keep looking at it. You know, they buy this expensive china waiting for one special day that never comes. Amen. <laughs> Actually, I got one from my grandmother. I brought it all the way from Nigeria. And then she has this, yeah, this beautiful plate, and she has it in the cupboard. And it's been there for as long as I could remember. Amen. Never used. Nobody saw, she doesn't serve nothing with it. They kept it there for a special occasion. So five, I think five years ago when I was in Nigeria, I decided to go and uh, I looked at it, and I've always liked that. And I asked her maybe she should just give me one of those. Because at the end of the day, they keep that for you to... When they pass, then the children can inherit it. And then they continue the same tradition. Amen. I brought it and I've never used it. It's in my office still. <laughs> right? And that is the way sometimes some Christians are. They were just saved, you know, to look pretty, look handsome, look cool before the word. Oh, I'm not a Christian. Oh, I don't sin anymore. I don't go to the bar anymore. I don't drink anymore. I don't steal anymore. Which is beautiful. But there's more to that. There is more to your salvation. There is more to your separation. This is what we are saying. Separation is a call into. Because if we do not, then we are separated into a vacuum. Number two. We must always remember that the call to separation is not just a physical one. It is mental, emotional, and most of all, spiritual. Right? It's not just a physical separation. Like when we talk about separation, oh, I, I, I don't, I, I, don't I, I separate from uh, my friends that were bad, that were like a negative influence on me. Yeah, that is part of it, but it's more than that. 
right? The physical separation sometimes is necessary, but sometimes you can separate from people physically, but emotionally and spiritually you are not. Amen. A lot of people can separate, but the only thing is that they separate so that they are not in a, they can continue to live the way they live without being, without people looking at them or knowing what they're doing. You know what I mean? So the people separate sometimes to go into the closet. Their spiritual life has not changed. They are not showing, they are not bearing fruit in keeping with their separation. So being separated is more than just a physical separation. It is more than just stopping. If you stop going to the bars and doing all that, it's wonderful. But there is more to it. There has to be what? Fruit in keeping. And so God says, the Bible says what? Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas unto what I what? Call them into. And Paul is such an interesting character. In Acts chapter 9, when he had an encounter on the way to Damascus. How many of us remember that story? Right? And Paul asked, Paul and Thomas in the New Testament were the first people, the first two characters that used the name uh, Lord. You know, even his first encounter with Jesus in Acts chapter 9, you know, the first thing they say, when Jesus said, I am Christ whom you are persecuting, the next thing Paul asked was, what would you have me do? Every call of God comes with an assignment. Every separation demands a total commitment from you and from me. We cannot be separated unto God and we are not involved in becoming a living epistle read of man. As a new believer, right, how am I impacting the life of the people around me, those whom I have separated from? Are they seeing something in me that is attractive, that is interesting, that they want to be like? You know, uh, somebody was telling me this afternoon, I was having a conversation, uh, and she said, yeah, when she stopped, doing certain things, you know, she didn't notice. After a while, her younger sister said, oh, you have changed. You don't do that. You don't do this anymore. You don't do this anymore. You don't do this anymore. And so she didn't even realize that, right? Because that is what separation does. Separation will project the new you. Does that make sense? You know, in Romans chapter 12, from verse 1 and 2, that we know very well, Paul said it again in a different way. He said, I beg you by the message of God, right, that you present your body a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Be not conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what is that good, pleasing, and acceptable will of the Lord? And so it is the transformation. Because every time there is a separation, it's a transportation in a way. It's a transformation. The Lord moves you from point A to point B. He doesn't move you from point A and stop you in a limbo. And this is the point. You cannot just be a Christian in a limbo. You have to be an active Christian. In the, la- in the way you live your life. Amen. All right. So number two, we must always remember that the call to separation is not just a physical one, but it's also mental and spiritual. It takes our complete yielding to the Holy Spirit for true separation to happen. So separation, therefore, is a function of the Holy Spirit. This is why in the previous classes we talked about the, the gift and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because everything we read here, if you open your Bible, let's go back again and to uh, Acts chapter 13. Now there was in, An- in the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, 
Moen, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tartarite, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, right? So is the function of the Holy Spirit. You cannot separate in your own strength. The changes we're talking about, separation is a change, is a new life, is a new uh, choices that you begin to make. And you can't do that in your own strength, in your own power. How many times have you tried to stop certain habit that you just can't? You tried everything, you walk with all, you try, you make decisions. Uh, by the end of the year, you begin to plan your New Year resolution. Uh, by New Year, this coming year, I will stop eating sugar. And <laughs> you know what I mean? I will not do that, I will not do that. I will not do this. And then two, three weeks down the line, what happened? Everything goes down the window. Oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. Because in our own strength, we cannot be completely separated. It is the function of the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not by our own strength. Verse 4 say, in verse 4 we see, it. So be sent out by the Holy Spirit. Being sent out, the separation, true separation is a function of the Holy Spirit. It is not by power, uh, Zechariah 4, say, it is not, it says, what is that mountain before Zerubbabel? It shall become what? A leveled ground. It is not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, by, by my spirit, says the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit in you that empowers you. To live that life of total separation unto the Lord. So verse 4 says, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyrus, uh, Cyprus. They're the key word there, the Holy Spirit. So number three, separation for a child of God is a call to a higher way of life or living. It is a change in our, life, our lifestyle and choices and values, right? So the suppression we're talking about is a change in my lifestyle. The choices I make, my values need to change. I can't tell the word that I'm separated unto the Lord, but my values have not changed. My choices have not changed. My lifestyle have not changed. I am no different from who I was two months ago, three years ago, but I say, Oh, I'm separated unto the Lord. You know, like this old phrase that people used to say, Oh, uh, I serve God in my heart. Uh, child of God, the scriptures say, Out of the abundance of the mouth of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is in your heart will be reflective in your lifestyle, in your choices. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So if you say, yes, you are serving God in your heart, actually, yeah, we're actually seeing that already. Amen. And so if people begin to question my separation unto the Lord, and I say, oh, don't talk to me because God is in my heart. Yeah, it is what is in your heart that is causing me to ask those questions. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So I cannot be full of, uh, I cannot be separated unto the Lord in my heart and my mouth. The Bible says what? Uh, good water, salt water and clean water will not come out from the same spring. It's not possible. And so you can't have the Holy Spirit in you and the fruit is not showing forth. You cannot build the temple of God in your heart. And the one who is enthroned in your heart, because the throne is a place where the, the king sits. So whoever is sitting on the throne of your heart dictates the way you live and conduct your life. Am I right? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Number four. Godly separation comes with spiritual responsibility. Responsibility first to God and second to man. And this is why separation is hard. Because responsibility is a privilege. 
responsibility begets accountability. We cannot want responsibility without accountability. And a lot of people don't want to be accountable, <laughs> but they want responsibility. And so no, there's no, there a solid, healthy responsibility will always follow ac accountability in the function of somebody who is totally responsible. And so our life first, godly separation is first what? A respons a, our responsibility first to please God. And if our life pleases God, it will please man. Amen. Man may not agree with me, but they will respect my values. They don't have to like me, but they will respect me because they know that. Because when I'm responsible to God, I will not do anything that would dishonor God. If I will not do anything to dishonor God, then the chances of me hurting my fellow man is 99.9% .9 impossible. Because I see man through the eyes of God. You see how it works. And so, godly separation makes me responsible to God. And how am I, how do I, how am I responsible to God? By His Word. If you love me, keep my commandment. And He said, My commandments are not bothersome. So, separate, number four, number five. Separation is God's idea for us because he wants the best for us. And so when God is calling us to a higher, oh, good evening, God blessings in you, Miss uh, yeah, Evangelist Eno from uh, the U.S. God bless you. We'll see you. Thank you. All right. So number five, separation is God's idea for us because God wants what is best. What do we mean by that? When God is calling you to a higher call, when he's saying, come up higher, he's not calling you out to punish you. He's not calling you out to live a miserable life. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, if I become, uh, what do they call that, deep <laughs> or fanatical, uh, being a true Christian can be very boring. And you hear people say that, Right? But I don't think it's boring. It's hard, but it's not boring. <laughs> it's not easy. That is the truth. And you see, when people say it's easy to be a Christian, I wonder, I, say, I don't know the kind of Christianity you are practicing. It's not easy. It's not easy to be a doormat. It's not easy to be called a fool for Christ. It's not easy for you to be... To turn the other cheek when you can actually show them and speak your mind. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy to be mistreated, to be misrepresented, and still do not try to defend yourself. It's not easy to, to let go. Because the life of, you see, when the Bible says, so when Jesus said, if any man want to follow me, that he must take up his cross and deny himself. To deny means to willingly, consciously, joyfully give up your right. Not by force, not by compulsion, not by compelling, not by coercion, not by manipulation, not by threat. But to willingly, joyfully give up your right. That is what it means to deny yourself. To deny myself, oh, it's all gone now, is that I want this ice cream, and if I don't give it to you, I've not done anything wrong. You need it, and I need it so badly. And I'm willing to say, okay, I'm willing to let go of my desire for sugar, and you can have it. Not because you manipulated me into giving it, not because you lied, or you threatened me. No, because I just joyfully went to let go. And this is why they say joy simply means Jesus first, orders, and then you at the bottom of the list. If you want to experience full joy, then you need to put Jesus first, orders next, and then you last. You must put the need of orders beyond your own. 
you must think well of other people. And so when God is calling us to that higher call, it looks like punishment. It may look like, oh, why is God trying to do this? Why is... But God is saying, I'm calling you to a higher call because you are a royal princess and a royal priest. Amen? Amen. Leviticus 20, verse 26 in your note says, ye, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am holy, and... And have you and have severed you from other people that you should be what mine? So God wants us to be His, and the only way we can do that is when we separate completely unto the Lord. So number six says, when we allow emotion and sentiment to get in the way of God's plan and purpose for our lives. Making godly decisions in relation to our work with God can become very, very difficult. You see, when we are too emotional and too sentimental, then it becomes very difficult. Like when God said to these people, they were in the church worshiping. Look at Acts chapter 13 again. They were in the church worshiping and everything was good. They were in this, you know, safe place, comfort zone. Uh, and then suddenly the Holy Spirit says, no, I have something else for you. I want you to move. It's a difficult thing when God is asking you to step out of your comfort zone. Right? If I'm very emotional and very sentimental, it becomes very difficult. How can I, oh, I've lived here all my life and this is all I have. And that is sentiment. Right? And so sometimes sentiment can make it very difficult for us to hear God. And when we get too emotional and too clicky, too touchy, too hypersensitive, and sometimes things that come our ways that we can ignore so that God will be glorified becomes very difficult. Because we need to always think of our decision in line with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Not just my, my, my feelings. Actually, our feelings get us in trouble. It gets us in trouble. Thank you. Our feelings can get us in trouble. Because, how, because can you imagine Paul and Barnabas? Here they were. This is their, their go-to places. You know, just, and God is saying, move to this point. God is saying, oh, uh, this person did this. Be kind to that person. Oh, try to be gracious, be forgiven. Oh, but if I do that, they would think I'm a fool. <laughs> right? That is my emotion coming in there. My sentiment. When Pastor Cliff felt that he was getting a nudge to leave here after 17 years right. in Calvary, he fought against it. Right. Because this was his comfort zone. Yeah. Right. And obey God. And it was the toughest thing he mm -hmm. did. So you, we have to. Our emotion, when you are too emotionally hypersensitive, you get too touchy. The Bible says easily offended. When I'm easily offended, right, it's difficult to be completely separated. Jesus said, offense will always come. <laughs> right? In Psalm 119, he said, Great peace have they that love the law, the word of God. Nothing shall offend them. Offense will come. Offense will come. That is a given. As long as we are in this flesh, as long as we are together like this, even twins, born of the same parents, they still offend each other. I say in every family, that's why they call it the black sheep. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> every family is God them. Amen. And we are a family of God. And this family too, we have them. Uh, maybe I, I don't know if I'm the black sheep. Amen. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I think that sometimes the black people, what people call them black sheep, are actually white sheep. And it just appears that they're black sheep. I, I, I strongly believe that. It's probably not true in every case. 
Okay. I really believe it's true in some cases. Okay, yeah. So you can be, you can be the, uh, but what I mean also is that in every family, in every group, in every community, there will be one or two people that will rob you the wrong way. If you keep running away because of that, you may be missing the greater assignment that God has for you. I always say this to people. I say, especially when God sends you, especially to a church situation, I say, when you go, this is how I do mine. This is how I learned it as a young Christian. When I go into a church, there is, I'm going in for two reasons. One of them has to work. Either that I'm going there to be a blessing or I'm going there to be blessed. And so if I'm not being blessed, then I need to look for the other option. Is God sending me there? To be a blessing. To do something. Because God, there is no vacuum in the realm of the spirit. In uh, the spiritual community where God is, there is no vacuum. And so there is always a reason. God does not do things randomly. Just for the fun of it. So if God sends you into a place, if you are not being blessed, then maybe God is sending you there to be a blessing. So you need to now begin to say, okay, God, what did you separate me into this situation for? Either or. Then if two are not, it, it is very seldom, unless it's completely not of God. If it's not of God, then none of those two will work. Then you need to find your level. Again, you cannot be sentimental about it. You cannot be emotional about it. If I'm being blessed in that place, then no man born of a woman, I will not allow you to cheat me out of my blessing because of your attitude, because I will stay there, because I've been separated unto God. Does that make sense? Any question before we continue? Any question? Are we all on the same page? All right. If you're watching online, if you have any question, you can type it in and I will look at it. Number seven. Godly separation is very difficult for what? Again, number seven, self-centered and emotionally immature Christians. When we are self-centered, when we all think about ourselves, when we think more of ourselves and our feelings, and not that we are not important, but if we elevate self above the Holy Spirit, then it's very difficult for us to be. Because separation unto the Lord is a call to a higher calling. It's a privileged calling. That's why I say responsibility is a privilege. God is raising you up for a higher goal. When every time God is saying separate, when God is calling you to a, a high sense of sanctification as a Christian, and that call is for every one of us, we cannot afford to remain babies forever. You know what I mean? As Christians, you cannot afford to be the same two years on. You are still the same. You are still struggling with the same weakness. In the five years, you are still saying the same story. No. You need to outgrow. It's like when, if, if you have a, unless the child is completely handicapped and God forbid and thank God for some of those children, but when a child is already up to the age of, uh, as a toddler, when it's time for the child to crawl, what happened? You encourage that child to crawl, right? When it's time for the child to start standing up, you want to start saying that. And when it's time for them to walk, you want them to, you know, they will fall and fumble, but you keep pushing so that until they get into that perfection. <clears throat> but if they get to that age and they are not able to, you as a parent, your heart will be grieved. If, if it becomes a, a, a physical uh, infirmity on that child, you will love the child but you will still feel pain in your heart because you want the child to be like every other child, to be able to go out and play and run. And he's not able to, not because it's his fault, but because he has a situation. 
But uh, so for some of us Christians too, you know, I believe that God is looking at us from heaven and he's expecting us now. He said, oh child, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I did things like a child. But now, I've left childish things behind. But a lot of Christians don't leave childishness behind. And that is spiritual immaturity. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I took it up quite a while ago. Childlike faith is what is God. It's the best thing imaginable. And but ch childish is a bad thing. Yeah. Childlike is the best thing. Yeah, childlike. They, yeah, they're two different things. You, you, that's you already. We're talking about childishness or childlike faith, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, uh, can somebody open to First Corinthians thirteen eleven, please? Thirteen verse eleven. Amen. Right. Childishness. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I behaved like a child. This is Paul speaking. He said there was days I was like a child. He, he, he was talking about his spiritual journey and maturity. And he said, now I have put away, I've put away because I'm now a man. I'm grown in Christ. I've been separated unto the Lord. So I have put away childishness. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, that, that's another way of saying I don't want to. Or that's the way God created me. Yes. Right? That's who I am. Deal with it. Yeah. No. If we can deal with it, we'll not talk about it. <laughs> right? Nobody is above. Change is a choice. And this is why Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you can write it down and go and meditate on it. Read it in different translations as many as you can. And listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Paul now speaking, he says what? I, I memorized part of it and I may not quote it right, but read it on your own. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you by the message of God. Right? He said, I'm begging you by the message of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, which is what? Your reasonable act of service, which is holy and acceptable unto God, that you might know. <laughs> and then he went to further and said, the part that gets to me, and he said, be ye transformed. By the renewing of your mind. That is to say, if who has, who has opened Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? You can read it so that we can just be in the same sink here. I want to bring out something for you. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, right. that you present your bodies right. a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right. Verse 2. Yeah. And be not conformed to this world. Just hold on one minute. Be not what? Conformed. Again, it's talking about separation. Go ahead. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just stop there. And be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word, the key word there, be ye. That means your choice. It's, nobody, it's not by laying of hands. <laughs> they can pray for you from sun up to sun down. But you have to will to. You have to choose to. You, you, the transformation, the renewing of your mind is a matter of choice. Maturity is a choice. 
You can choose to say, no, I can't do this anymore. I am better than this. I need to, no, no, I cannot continue this way. I cannot afford to live this way. And then you begin to what? Renew your mind. And then you will know what? That which is good. When your mind is renewed, you will know what? That what is good, and if it is good, it is pleasing to God. And if it is pleasing to God, it's acceptable to God. And if it's acceptable to God, it is perfect. And so, and people talk about the permissive will. The, no, 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 no. The will of God is his word. It's one, it's one will. God doesn't have three wills. But when you know if your mind is renewed, whatever you do is good. If it's good, it's pleasing. If it's pleasing, it's acceptable. And if it's acceptable, it is perfect. Yeah? Transform means to change from one thing to another. Yeah. Yeah, and that is the transportation. Be ye transformed. You transform. That is separation. You separate from one life to another. Amen. Okay, number seven. We're still there. The scripture there is First Corinthians fourteen twenty. What did they say there? Somebody can it's there in our note. Can somebody read that loud? Under number seven on the note. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Yeah. Uh, brethren, be not children in understanding. However, in malice, however, in malice be you children, but in understanding be men. Right. I like that translation. In malice. You're right. The, uh, the King James say evil. In malice. You know, do you, uh, you know, can you, do you know some Christians keep malice? That's what the Bible says. I love that translation that our brother just read. In malice be children. Why would a Christian keep malice? Right? He said what? He said, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Again, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is separation 101. It starts with the mind. It's a spiritual thing. God places situations, in, in put you in a very difficult situation and see how you will react or respond. Amen. I was talking with Esther yesterday and, uh, well, uh, you know, there's, there's a situation in our family that we're dealing with. And for weeks I've been angry. And I've been, in my mind, be angry with this person. And I'm saying, <laughs> You know, and I just, uh, yesterday, I think I was just sitting down the, two nights ago. I was sitting in the office, and I felt convicted in my spirit, and, and I just needed to call. And when I called, and having the conversation with the, the person, and after that I, I got home, I told us, I said, we oh, were just talking to him, I just felt so sorry for him in my spirit, right? And I said, oh, and I just had to bless him, I need to just send him money. You, you, you know what I mean? But because you need to, your mind, you cannot allow people's action to inform your behavior. But some people just don't want to grow up. Right, and this is, the, this is why the scripture is saying, in your thinking, don't be children. Mm -hmm. It's children that throw tantrum. It is children that keep malice. You know how those little children... When they don't get their way, they go to the corner and begin to talk and they put up an attitude. And, and, and every time you put up an attitude, you will always make mistakes. And you end up multiplying problems for yourself. And I, I remember that happened uh, this summer. I don't know what happened with courage. And he doesn't talk and he just kind of bottled it up and he was just having this attitude. And I t told him to come with me to go do something. And because he had an attitude, and he went and bashed, thank God he bashed the car against Esther's uh, vehicle. If it was another person he hit, it would have been trouble, right? And so I told him, I said, see, this is what happens when your mind is full of, Right? Because you are putting up an attitude, but you have it bottled up, you're not talking, you're trying to keep malice. What happened? You get a pent-up emotion. 
and things begin to go south. And this is why the Bible says, do not keep malice. Right? Speak out. If somebody does something that you don't like, speak out. If they do something that you don't understand, ask questions. Don't assume. As a child of God, I love that translation. Be innocent. All right. Number eight. A stubborn Christian who is set in, in his or her ways will find it very di difficult to heed the instruction to separate. Like you said, uh, Sister Melody said, that's what I said, that is who I am, and things like that. You know, they are set in their ways. They are stubborn. They don't want... And stubbornness is not the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. <laughs> I think in some cases it is actually to the Spirit because we refuse to change our, uh, our thinking towards God. Right, yeah, in, yeah, in a, in a positive way, yeah. Right. Stubborn towards the devil, not towards our fellow That's brother. Right. <laughs> If we are stubborn towards the devil, because the devil is a stubborn devil himself, so you, because he doesn't give up, right? And so if you are stubborn towards the devil, good, but not towards your fellow brother. <laughs> yes, that's similar to the surrendering thing. Right. Like, you get to surrender to God completely, as we all have done when we sleep. Right. And, but, yeah, but then uh, Winston Churchill, uh, we're not going to surrender to the bad. <laughs> right. Okay. The, in, under number eight, there, there's a scripture, Proverbs 12, 15 says, I, use, I found this translation, so I, I wrote that. A stubborn fool considers what? His own way, the right one. Yep. Right? A stubborn, this is the scripture that says, he considers his own way, the right one. He's set in his ways. Right? But a person who listens to advice is wise. In Proverbs 26, 12, again, you say, What? Well, see it, a man who is wise in his own eyes. They know it all, they have all the answers. <laughs> you know, they come to you and they're talking, you know, like you're talking to some people, they'll tell you, I know, I know, I know. And I'm like, Okay, you already know everything. <laughs> And God, this is what it is. We need to be what? Two things that stand out for me tonight is that. That scripture. You know, in your thinking, don't be like children. Right? And so by keeping malice. Why should a child of God keep malice? Hmm? Pastor. Yeah. That, uh, Or no, uh, no, that's um, consider, no, cons uh, verse, uh, who considers his own way the right way, the right one, but a uh, person who listens to advice is wise, not always. Okay. You can get wrong advice. You're right. Right. You can get wrong advice. That's true. And that's why you need the Holy Spirit. Because some people can advise you wrongly and deceive you and it, we saw that even in separation from the beginning to confirm that even in Genesis it was the wrong counsel that Eve got from uh, the serpent that got us into this journey that we are in now <laughs> right you can get the wrong advice of course and that's why the company you keep is important the people so the people you are listening to who are they listening to Right? Where are they getting their strength from? Their source. Right? That's why they say, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. So the people, the company you keep is, is important. The Bible says, he that keeps company with the wise will be wise. So you can listen to bad advice and that can get you into trouble. So that is important. Be careful who you take advice from. <laughs> that is very, very important. 
Because every time people speak to you, whether they call themselves Christians, they can be called pastors, prophets, anything, whatever you hear, no matter how nice it sounds, let it line up with the word of God. Amen. Very, very important. Right? That is why, it, uh, that, and then it brings us what our brother just said, now number nine, also emphasize it. A lot of good ideas in our heads can become enemy of God's best for us. Right? Because that good idea is some of the cancer they can give you. And they can give you some very good advice. But is it God's word? Is that good advice of God? It may sound very good, but is it of God? And this is where the advice comes through. Because if we keep listening to the wrong voices because it sounds good and it tickles our emotion, it tickles our flesh, then it is hard for us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit when he's telling us to separate. Because a lot of times you are heading in the wrong direction, right? And the Lord is saying, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. But because your emotion is so engrossed on it, your flesh has been taken, it sounds good. You feel good about it. And what happened? Before you know it, boom. Because you didn't take caution, you didn't take instruction from the Holy Spirit. So that the fact that the idea may be good does not mean that it's of God. Does that make sense? That, that an idea is good does not mean that it's of God. But every time it's of God, it's always good. <laughs> right? So always remember that God has nothing but our best interests at heart. So then every call for separation is for our own good. And that, let, let's give an example like uh, brother just talked about not all good advice. You can be in a, let's use a relationship for instance. You can be in a very toxic, terrible relationship because your emotion is so into it and you don't, you don't hit, and your parents may, because there's something about, especially mothers, they can see things that you don't see. You can be going into that and they say, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> no, don't, don't. There's something about that man. There's something about this man. There's something about this girl. I don't want, nay, because your emotion is so engrossed in it, you don't, you take, you don't listen to that. You're listening to your hormones and everything. And then before you know it, boom. So the call for separation may be difficult at that point. But if you hit the good counsel, you may be saving yourself a lifetime of trauma and headache and pain. Right? You may, go, you may be going to join yourself to some good some friends that look cool and they look nice and doing... You know, remember, how many of us remember when we had uh, the evening we talked about these five brothers? How many of you remember the story yeah. of the five brothers? You can't remember it? Okay, I'll tell you again tonight. Again, talking about good counsel that can be destructive. So these five brothers, these are the, actually your five fingers represent five brothers, five siblings. And so it was a time of difficult famine. And so this was the, the pinky one was the youngest of all. And they were all very hungry at home. So the baby one began to cry and say, I'm so hungry. What are we going to do? And so the next one here to the, the next younger one said, oh, our neighbors, they are away from their house. And I know they have a lot of food at home. <laughs> right? And so that's one idea. We can go there and steal some food. And so, so, so oh, oh, you mean our neighbors have food and they're not at home? And then the, this third one said, oh, then why don't we go and steal some food from their house, right? And so the fourth one said, oh no, so why don't we go and steal some food? And so this one said, okay, what if we get caught? Then the fourth one said, oh, what is the leg for? 
Nobody will catch us. Before they come, we will run away. You know, we'll just go in, get in, and get out. And so this one says, count me out of your bad plan. And this is why he never joins them. That's why you said the storm stays away from the bad guy. So actually, majority is not always right. <laughs> right? Do you see how it is now? And so the fact that these ones are always together, you see, majority does not mean right all the time. Loud does not mean right. Just like what is happening in the world today. Right? There's a lot of loudness going on. Right? They're trying to push some agenda to us. You know what I'm talking about? That does not make it right. Right? You must learn to stand alone. Being alone, there is power in aloneness. Look at this guy. He's so fat. He didn't go to steal, but he's still feeding fat. Amen. <laughs> he's alone, but he's strong. You know, he's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Right? Blessed is he that does not what? Dwell in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is what? In the law of the Lord. And in the Lord of the Lord, that does he always what? Meditate day and night. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bear his fruit at the season. This is divine separation. All right? <laughs> Amen. Quickly, we almost, oh, our time again tonight. So Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thought that I Think towards you, see the Lord, the thought of peace and not of evil to give you what an expected end. So God is always thinking of a good end for us. So what good ideas do you have that may be hindering you from hearing God for yourself? His call for separation unto him may be hindered by good counsel because you are hungry. You see, hunger can be a very terrible thing. You may be emotionally hungry because you're lonely. Right? You may be emotionally hungry because you feel rejected. Nobody wants you. Nobody cares about you. You may be physically hungry because you need what your friends have. You don't dress the way they do. You want to drive what they drive. You want to live where they live. You want to wear what they wear. You want to go on vacation like the Joneses with your children. You know what I mean? You know, hunger can be a very dangerous thing. And when you are hungry, you will hear voices. I can tell you. When you are hungry, you will hear voices. But the choice now is, are you going to heed onto that negative voice to satisfy your hunger temporarily? Are you going to make a permanent decision over a temporary situation? Or are you willing to say, no, I'm willing to wait upon the Lord? And I will renew my strength. Are you willing to stay separated and wait for the timing of God for your life? Or are you going to let good ideas? You know, the world talks about being smart. You know, the other way, to, uh, the other word for a thief in the world is a smart man. <laughs> you know, they say, oh, is, they, is very smart. That means they know how to cut corners. Are you willing to be a fool for Jesus? All good, not all good things are God things. Number 12. 13 says, but all God's things are what? Good things. James chapter 1 verse 17 said, every good and perfect gift is what? what? From above and cometh down from the Father of light with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Number 14 quickly. That it is good idea, that it's a good idea does not mean it is from God. The uh, Proverbs chapter 14 says what? Well, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end therefore is what? Destruction. So always remember your five fingers. <laughs> Quickly. All good ideas are God's ideas. All God's ideas are, go are good ideas. So what is blocking your spiritual ears from hearing God? What is blocking your vision? What is blocking your spiritual eyes from seeing the danger of your compromising choices? That is a question for you to meditate on. What hunger, what kind of hunger, what kind of loss is blocking you from hearing and seeing 
And this is why Paul prayed for us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 18, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened so that you will know what is the good thing, what God has planned for his people, right? In verse 18 of uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in Christ. And so this Tom, if your, his eyes were open, so he saw the glory that was in store for him and he was willing to wait. He was willing to endure the hunger, endure the loneliness, endure rejection for now, endure the mockery. They can call you names. You may not have what they have, but don't compromise. Follow God with all your heart. Ask God, what would you have me do? There is an assignment for you. The people in your life, God placed them there in your life so that you can be a positive influence, starting from your home to your workplace. Don't, don't destroy. There's a proverb in Africa. There's a, a they say, you know this uh, little shrimp. Shrimp is it shrimp? They say you don't. They say only a foolish man will go to, will try to burn his finger in trying to roast uh, one shrimp in a campfire. <laughs> All right, it's not worth it. You know what I mean? It's no, you know, just one shrimp. It's not what you burning your finger on a campfire for. And the things of this world that we are compromising and not allowing ourselves to follow after God with passion is like a little shrimp, a little moment of pleasure. Right? And then everything goes out, especially for the young ones amongst us tonight. I want to challenge you. I know you guys are living in a very difficult time in your life, but you need to make a choice for God. Live holy, live pure. Don't compromise your standard. Don't compromise your value. The one that God has planned for you will come. Amen. Quickly, 17, so that I will finish this. What spiritual excess luggage are you carrying along with you on your journey of faith? Anyway, I will stop here. We'll, I will add this to next son, uh, the next one, and we will talk about it because I don't want us to go beyond one hour. So, but go continue to read this. The question now is, what is hindering your vision? God is calling us to a life of spiritual separation, a life of holiness, a life of complete commitment. You see, when a man or a woman is not completely separated or not willing to separate from unto God in their heart, you can't hear God well. You can't hear God for your marriage. You can't hear God for your finances. You can't hear God for your children, if you have children. You can't hear God for your spiritual responsibility. You can't hear God in relation to how he wants you to be a blessing to his kingdom. You know, the first time in Acts chapter 9, Paul says, well, what would you have me do? A man who is separated unto the Lord wants to serve God with his body, his strength, and his might. Everything in him. Are we at this point? Because we need, God is calling us to that place of total commitment and dedication unto him. Amen. All right. Any question or comment before we close for tonight? where God is calling us to a life of purity, holiness unto the Lord, and that cannot be overemphasized. 
you know, if God be God, follow him. And, and I'm so glad that we are all here tonight and um, thank God for the work and our encouragement. But every one of us be encouraged and uh, you cannot do this on your own strength. You can't do this on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. By strength shall no man prevail. It is not by power, it's not by might. And you need the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you, we talked about the Holy Spirit, and if you want to know more, you can come see me in the office, and we can talk and we can pray. And I'm telling you, we are living in a very interesting season, spiritually. And this is the time to follow God passionately, do you know as we pray, I'll give you this information for free. Don't be deceived. Do you know that following God is now the in thing? I'm telling you. That is what is involved. Living for God. You see, don't listen to this popular nonsense on social media and news media. There are more people seeking God now than ever before. That's what I'm saying. There are more people wanting the highway of truth and righteousness than ever before. People are beginning to see the lies of the devil and the lies in the world. People are truly seeking God. In Iran, there's over a million people left behind Muslims because of the Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, people are, you know, it, even in the Western world, right? In, in, in the world, uh, uh, what they call this thing, woke, the wokeness is becoming old fashioned. Maybe it's awakening. It's an awakening, the awakening happening. And my prayer is that the Bible says the first shall be the last, but I pray that that will not be our portion. Yeah. Right? Let us, those of us who are here, not become the last. Right? Because the, the, the last are really coming in. I'm telling you, you know, you may not see them in church, but people are seeking God, and they're not just seeking God for entertainment. It is the people who are old in the church, I'm not talking about age, that are looking for entertainment, that are saying Christianity is boring. But there are people out here in the world right now that are hungry for the real thing. And they know that the life of... Everything, nothing is working. Nothing is Sex is no longer working. It's the cheapest thing in the market today, but it's not satisfying. Drug is everywhere. It doesn't satisfy nothing. All the money in the world is not making it. And so Jesus is the answer. So if you've got Jesus, you've got the real deal. Hold on to him and wear him proudly. Don't apologize for your faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we give you all the praise. We bless you for being such a faithful God. We thank you for your righteousness. Father, we pray for as many, O oh God, that are seeking you. May they find you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Father God, that the eyes of the understanding of the world will be open to see you. We thank you, O oh Lord, that indeed in the last days, O oh God, the Spirit of God will cover the earth like the water cover the seas. We thank you, Heavenly Father God, for the remnant, O oh God, that are coming from the north, from the south, from the east and the west. Lord, prepare us, O oh God, as a body to receive them. Heavenly Father God, make us, O oh God, spiritual midwife. I pray for the anointing of spiritual midwife upon the youngest of this church to the oldest in the name of Jesus that as the broken, the battered, the drunk, oh God the sexually perverted as they walk into this door for that God, that the glory of God will just embrace them and break them and set them free in the mighty name of Jesus. For that God we pray for a supernatural grace upon this house oh God, a place of refuge, oh God, that as the broken coming, they will live fixed in the name of Jesus. Lord, give us a large heart, a heart that will embrace, that will love, but not a heart that will tolerate nonsense, but a heart that will love men out of their sin, a heart that will love men out of their brokenness, a heart that will love them out of their pain, a heart that will love them out of their rejection, in the mighty name of Jesus, that through us, Jesus will be revealed. To us, Jesus will be seen. 
Thank you, eternal rock of ages, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And if you are in Grand Cash and you are in Canada, and if you are online, you can reach me by phone. But if you are in Grand Cash, child of God, Cornerstone is open. You are invited to come. You can come in and talk to me. Jesus loves you, but Jesus does not love the sin, but he loves you. And we are committed to seeing you healed, restored unto the Lord, to the original way that God has created you. God bless you. We love you. And have a wonderful week. Amen.